just want to get started. <laughs> um, yeah, so hi, I'm Aaron Newman. Um, I'm a prof here in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience. I'm actually the chair of the department, so I, I'm sort of in charge of the department uh, as well at the moment. And this here is Danny Godfrey, who is the TA for the class. Hello. Um, he's also a grad student in my lab, so working on his master's right now, yeah. soon PhD. Yeah. Um, and uh, I'll probably go into a lot of the background in a minute, but um, this class was created last year. Um, we first taught it last summer. So it's a pretty new class and it's still under development and evolution based on feedback. Hey, come on in, find a seat. Um, so uh, that is to say it's um, you know, new in, in a lot of ways and there may be still some, some rough patches. Uh, so bear with us on that. Um, and to that end, we're also very open to feedback um, and you'll, you'll sort of get that sense throughout the term. Um, this is definitely not like we feel like we've got all the answers and you better like what we're doing. Um, we hope you like what, you're, what we're doing, um, but if there are things that we're doing that you wish would be different or, you know, any sort of constructive feedback, we're really happy to hear that. Um, and um, we create a lot of opportunities uh, for that. Um, I think that's really all before I get into the slides. And... There we go. Okay, uh, so to start off, uh, I want to recognize that Dalhousie University is located in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Uh, we're all treaty people, and this is something I say not lightly. It's, it's really important, and I think uh, for a long time has not been properly acknowledged, and obviously we're really sort of um, more and more recently coming to terms with the colonial history of of our country and uh, even of the university and sort of um, Dalhousie's racist past. Uh, so I think it's really important to be mindful and thinking of ways that uh, we can be inclusive and really appreciate the, the contributions of the Mi'kmaq people to Nova Scotia and stewards of our land uh, and really sort of bring that into the curriculum. Um, and also acknowledging the history, contribution and legacies of African Nova Scotian people who've lived here for over 400 years. Um, same story around colonialism and, and poor treatment. Um, so there's a lot to, to, to sort of reconcile there. How much of that impacts data science, you may wonder. I think it's important to acknowledge regardless. Um, but as we'll sort of touch on, and maybe you'll have opportunities to explore a little more, um, certainly, you know, the world of software coding tech uh, has, you know, it turned into a, a very male dominated um, and often sort of chauvinistic and white dominated uh, sort of culture. And that's something that's being recognized and addressed. Um, and, you know, I, I became really aware, you know, as I was developing the textbook and including things that it's like, oh, that's another white man that I'm quoting and that's another white man. Um, so, you know, change is coming, but uh, another thing that just to sort of put out there and, and really recognize and, and be mindful of as we move forward. Okay, uh, coming to more, more class focused things. Uh, so today we just did introductions um, and we look forward to getting to know all of you uh, better over the coming weeks and months. Um, bear with us. I'd like to learn everybody's names. Uh, it turns out it was a lot easier when your names floated above your, your faces on Teams um, and a lot harder when I can only see like your eyes, um, but we'll get there. Uh, so we're going to start with a syllabus review that will maybe take the first half uh, of our class today. We've got two hours. And then uh, we'll go through orientation to what we call the tech stack, which is just sort of fancy speak for the, the software and stuff that we're going to use in this course, including the course website, the textbook, Teams, uh, Data Camp, and CoCalc, um, which is kind of a lot when you first start the course, and it may seem like it's sort of all over the place. Um, but bear with us, um, everything's pretty closely linked together, and you'll get the hang of it pretty quickly. Okay. Uh, oh, right. Introductions. I put slides. Uh, so uh, besides love of neuroscience, another thing Danny and I share is a love of bikes. Um, I prefer the non-motorized variety. He 
just for the motorized variety. Have our notes back um, But uh, yeah, just, uh, we're, we're real people with, with lives uh, outside of the university. Um, so when you message us on Teams and we don't respond right away, it might be because we're out riding. Um, but we do try and endeavor to, to be as responsive as we can within reason. Um, incidentally, the other guy in the photo with me is uh, Dr. Taylor Helmut's husband, Carl. Uh, small world. Okay, uh, so the syllabus. The syllabus is online. Uh, hopefully you've seen that uh, already. Um, and I'm just going to go through the different uh, sort of pieces uh, of the syllabus here. So this is really more of a, an outline uh, kind of slide. Um, but start before I go into sort of the nitty gritty of the class, you know, what is the class about? What is data science? Um, so data science is an umbrella term. These are a couple of quotes to describe the entire complex and multi step process used to extract value from data or the ability to bring structure to large quantities of formless data and make analysis possible. Um, so it's, it's a relatively new term, especially it's become like a, a buzzword uh, kind of term. Um, but there's a reason for that, because with the explosion of the Internet and IoT and, and all the stuff, um, we have more and more data. And within neuroscience, I'll talk a bit more in a minute, but we've got you know, technologies like fMRI and EEG and single unit recording that can record you know, lots and lots of data points every millisecond, and you end up with these massive, massive data sets. Um, so data science becomes really important for, for neuroscience. Um, data science is often sort of conflated with or contrasted with uh, statistics. And statistics is actually a part of data science, but data science is a little more all encompassing. So statistics, as you've hopefully learned from uh, second year, uh, is it 2501? Um, you're focused on testing hypotheses based on data. So the general process is you formulate hypotheses, then you run an experiment, you collect data, and then you perform statistics to test those hypotheses. And you know, in, in the sort of typical approach, you hope for a p-value less than 0.05. That means some difference between things was significant, and then you're happy. And if your p-value is greater than 0.05, then you're sad. Um, and the correct use of, of statistics avoids what we call harking, which means hypothesizing after the results are known, which is honestly quite widespread in, in science in general, certainly in psychology and neuroscience, historically anyway. Um, and, and that's really like, you, you start out probably with some hypotheses, you run the experiment, you run statistics, you maybe run lots of different statistical tests and find out which ones are significant, and then you write your paper around those significant results and sort of step back and formulate, reformulate your hypotheses based on, you know, this sort of like, we thought this and it was true, um, even if that wasn't your initial thought, um, which is a little dicey, um, especially in the sort of formal uh, statistical process. Um, so data science instead is the bigger picture of like, how do you store the data? How do you represent the data, you know, in terms of like file structure and file types and databases and that sort of thing? How do you manipulate data? And I, I hasten to say here, we don't mean manipulate as in twist the data to meet our needs or like, you know, cook the data or something like that. What we mean is that when you collect raw data, usually there's a lot of data and a lot of noise and you want to bring some structure to it and you want to remove noise. Say you run a behavioral experiment, maybe people make mistakes, they make errors on some trials and you want to remove those trials. That's a kind of data manipulation. Um, so the sort of formatting, removing noise, cleaning, filtering, optimizing the data to find the signals that you want. Um, visualizing the data, so actually looking, looking at it in different ways besides a bunch of numbers. Exploratory analyses, um, which can involve visualization, but also performing statistics. Um, and then more formal sorts of statistics and also machine learning. Um, and so statistics comes in there, but the, the thing is, with data science is it's a little more uh, sort of all encompassing, uh, obviously in terms of you know, all the different things it's doing, but specifically in statistics, rather than the sort of hypothesis experiment test, you can still do that but there's a little more sort of leeway to also say we're doing exploratory research and be honest about that and not like, you know, say after the fact that you have these hypotheses, but just say like, we didn't actually know what was going to happen. And so we did some stuff and we ran a bunch of tests and here's what came out. And if we want to validate that, maybe we have to replicate the experiment, run it again, this time with the more sort of formal statistical structure. 
And then machine learning will come to at the end of the course. Um, is again, a very trendy uh, term, very popular topic, um, uh, widely used now in like artificial intelligence, self-driving cars, um, you know, Amazon telling you what you should buy next, Netflix telling you what you should watch next and all that kind of stuff. Um, machine learning and statistics are actually more similar than you might think. Uh, and often machine learning uses the same kinds of uh, statistical models as classical statistics, like regression, if you, if you cover that in your stats class. Um, the difference is that in statistics, again, you sort of have your data and you run a specific test, test a hypothesis, and either it's significant or not. Machine learning, you're actually trying to use the data to predict future data. And so it's almost like you're sort of reversing the statistical process. So instead of saying, OK, like, you know, here we've got the data and does it sort of fit our model? Machine learning is more like, OK, we collect some data, we fit a model to it. And if that model is a good model, then it should predict more data. So if we collect more data, um, we should actually be able to accurately predict the results uh, based on the existing data. Um, so it's just sort of using statistics uh, in a different way. Um, so anyway, that's kind of the, the contrast between data science and statistics while also sort of defining data science. Um, and as I said, in, in psychology and neuroscience, increasingly data is collected with computers, so your data is digital uh, to begin with. Um, still, you know, some people use uh, paper and pencil tests, a lot of standardized tests in like clinical psychology or say language assessments may still be done on paper. But increasingly data is collected with computers. Um, we get large detailed data sets, uh, including from each individual, we may have lots and lots of data. So we might run lots and lots of trials. Um, each trial or you know, each experiment may have high temporal and spatial resolution. So like millisecond level recording of data, you know, uh, an fMRI scan typically has, uh, you would sort of have a number of slices. You might have 30 slices through the brain and each of those is maybe 64 by 64 pixels. So if you do the math, that works out to be like 200,000, 300,000 individual data points, and you're collecting that every second or something like that. So you end up with these massive data sets. Um, and then you might you know, run and collect data for an hour, and you might then run a longitudinal study where somebody's coming back to you know, get these MRI scans every month for, or every year over some period of time. And you might collect lots of other measures. So you might collect you know, people's working memory capacity and their language abilities and their socioeconomic status and you know, all kinds of other things. So you end up with this, these very rich data sets with lots of kind of you know, data points and lots of different kinds of data all for each individual. And then you may have many individuals. So the trend now like in neuroimaging, which is a field that I, I work in, you know, when I started out, a typical fMRI study would have like 10 to 15 subjects in it. Now that's considered grossly underpowered. You're expected to have 20 to 30 minimum, 40 or 50 is better. And the really sort of big studies that are set to really, you know, sort of say like, you know, what does things look like at the population level and what, how can we capture the variation among people in the population? They're shooting for, you know, a, a thousand people in a study. So, so massive, massive amounts of data. So now, you know, to be a neuroscientist in this field, you not only have to understand how to like design and interpret an fMRI experiment and analyze fMRI data, but you actually need these data science skills to be able to sort of manage the data and manage the, the sort of pipelines and workflows and that sort of thing. Um, and then uh, another trend is an increasing expectation that people's scientific practice will be what we call open science. So historically, you know, a lab does an experiment, they write it up and all anybody ever sees uh, of that experiment is what whatever the researcher chose to put in their article in terms of the methods. So they might have like, you know, left details out of the methods. They might have, you know, done some analyses that they didn't report or not analyze the data in, in certain ways that it could be analyzed. Um, so now with open science, the expectation, and this is, you know, becoming a requirement of publishing in a lot of journals, is that when you publish, you actually make your data publicly available through some sort of online repository. And you also make your code available. So all the analysis, all the code that you use to run the analyses is also out there. And so basically it, it sort of forces people to be accountable and means that your data, you know, your results are theoretically truly reproducible, that anybody else can download your data and your code and rerun your analysis or potentially, you know, do different analyses and mine the data, um, which is also important because a lot of this data is very expensive to collect. 
you know, fMRI data to run an MRI scanner uh, is about five hundred dollars an hour. It takes an hour to run, you know, get data from one person. So you're talking like you know tens of thousand dollars uh, for a study, and that's public money. That's grant money that's coming usually from governments. And so it seems pretty reasonable that if you spend all that money collecting data if there's the potential for other people to use that data and sort of come up with you know other insights or, or knowledge from that you should allow them to do that right so you know um, being able to sort of do data science well makes it a lot easier to sort of practice open science um, because you can easily get your code you know sort of organized nicely readable and uh, shareable uh, and, you know, this isn't just my opinion. Uh, so this paper was uh, it's like an, a, a comment and opinion paper in Nature Reviews Neuroscience from uh, just this last March. And uh, the um, sort of, you know, the, the bold face bit there, code has become central to neuroscience and the neuroscience community must take steps to ensure its reproducibility and best coding practices. Improving code readability benefits individual researchers and the wider neuroscience community. And this is something I'll come back to a little later, but it's not enough just to, you know, sort of write code to analyze your data. You actually want to do it in a way that follows conventions and coding styles and is uh, sort of accessible. So when other people look at your code, they can understand what's going on there. Um, and the analogy I like to use there is, you know, in probably first year, certainly second year, I'm sure you were exposed to APA format for writing a paper, right? And on the one hand, that seems like this sort of excessively specific um, set of rules that it's painful to, you know, sort of try and follow. But on the other hand, it means that all of the work that's done within the field uh, is sort of held to the same standards in terms of, you know, how it's written, the details that are provided, the structure of it, and that sort of thing. Um, so these standards are actually really useful uh, for, for areas of science to develop overall. Um, and then I, I'm not going to read the rest of that, but you know they're sort of making the point that I'm making that it's good that you're in this class um, because more and more people need to know coding and, and data science in order to do neuroscience. Um, there's lots of different uh, programming languages, you know, hundreds if not thousands. Uh, some of the most popular ones are Python, which we're going to use in this class. R, um, which you may have heard of, it's mostly used for statistics. Um, but for data science more generally, MATLAB uh, is another one that's used in, in some areas of neuroscience and engineering, Java, and then sort of C and its, its affiliates like C++ and C Sharp um, are used in data science, but they're, they're more sort of widely used in, in other areas uh, as well. And when I was developing this course, I did a little survey of, of people in, in the Department of Psychology and Neuroscience here at Dell. Uh, just to get a sense of you know who was using coding languages, what languages were were being used, and you can see it's all over the map, um, and that's really kind of the point I'm trying to make with this slide is that there isn't like one language that you can learn and be guaranteed that you know now you can do anything and do data science uh, anywhere um, or work in any lab. In fact, it really depends on the lab, and often it depends on kind of the work that the lab does. So my lab. Um, we actually used to use MATLAB, now we use Python pretty much exclusively. Um, and that move was mostly because for the EEG analyses we wanted to use, the so software was written in Python. And so it just sort of made sense. Um, turns out Python is a very flexible and, and useful language, so I, I'm happy with that decision. Um, but different people are different, you know, comfortable with different things. But the important thing is that regardless of what coding language you learn, if you learn to code, it becomes a lot easier to learn other coding languages. So you take this course using Python, you go and you're working in a lab that's using MATLAB, the actual sort of, you know, syntax and the words you type and the commands may be a little different, but the underlying sort of mental approach to how do you approach coding and write code and sort of structure um, your ideas and your steps and all that sort of stuff is very generic. Um, and so it's, it's quite easy to say, oh, okay, like I know how to do that in Python, and so in MATLAB, it's just like, you know, I have to use, um, you know, a square bracket instead of a colon or, or something like that. Um, so it's a lot, in, in most cases anyway, a lot easier to sort of learn a new programming language once you know one than it is even to learn a new spoken language if you know another spoken language. Um, so why would we bother using coding? And um, one point that uh, I'm going to make today repeatedly and um, you're certainly going to learn is that coding is uh, it's, it's work. 
and it's it's a lot of time just trying stuff out and frankly failing and making mistakes and figuring out how to like fix those mistakes. Um, that's just part of the process. Um, so, you know, why would we spend all this time learning to code if we could just open up Excel? Our data is uh, already like in a spreadsheet. You know, in Excel, I can run t tests, I can compute means, I can generate graphs. Um, but there's a lot of reasons why coding is better. So it's scalable. So imagine that you run a, a study with 10 subjects, each one generates a data file. So now you've got 10 Excel data files and maybe you have to like copy and paste them to, to merge them together, or maybe you have to do stuff on each individual subject. So that's not really scalable um, in the sense that if you then run 100 subjects, it's 100 times more work and 100 times more time for you to actually do whatever you're doing with those, those data if you're doing it manually in Excel. Whereas with, with code, you can basically just list all the subjects you want to run, write the code and say, do that 100 times, and the computer will do all the, the, the labor for you. Um, so it, you know, it's, it's very scalable in that way. It's auditable, um, meaning, again, like you can look at your code, you can show your code to your supervisor, you can put your code on the web, anybody can read it and see what you did. And if you made mistakes, they can tell you, um, hopefully in a constructive way. Um, whereas if you're doing stuff manually in Excel, you're pointing and clicking. And if you make a mistake, you're probably not going to know that you made a mistake. And it's going to be very hard to figure out where that mistake happened or you know what happened. Um, so it's not audible in the same way. So in a similar vein, code is reproducible. So once you've got that program written, you can run it again and again and again. Um, and so that's also useful. Like if, if you run an experiment, you get some cool results, you want to replicate the experiment, you don't really have to do much more work to analyze the second experiment because you just basically sort of put new data through the same software and get the results. Um, and ultimately, coding gives you a lot more power and flexibility in terms of what you do. You're not constrained by what Microsoft thinks you should be able to do in Excel or, or not do. Um, and the great thing about Python in particular, and I'm going to talk more about Python in a minute, is that it's an open source programming language, which means that there's no company controlling it. There's a, a sort of not-for-profit organization that oversees the development of Python and decides you know, what changes get integrated and that sort of thing. But you've got a whole community of users who are developing the language, and then a, a much larger com community of users who are developing add-ons to the language, so different packages that basically sort of work in Python, they're written in Python usually, um, but they add to the power of Python. So I mentioned like the PEG research, um, there are Python packages specifically for doing EEG, there's Python packages for doing single unit recording for fMRI and that sort of thing. Um, so it, it creates this uh, sort of platform that other people can develop on and innovate on and sort of expand the, the language in all kinds of different directions. Um, so a lot of power that way. So why Python? Um, maybe I've already convinced you. Um, they have a cool logo if you spend time looking at it. Um, it's like two snakes, but the top snake makes a P and the bottom snake makes a Y. Um, Python is uh, very common in data science. Um, it's a pretty common language overall, um, but especially in data science, so doing tasks that sort of involve manipulation of data. Um, and uh, in other areas like machine learning uh, as well. It's widely used in neuroscience and psychology, and there's lots of packages developed. So I've mentioned some of those. There's another one called PsychoPy that's used for presenting stimuli in experiments and basically running experiments, you know, collecting reaction times, running EEG experiments, that sort of thing. Um, so it's, you know, basically like if you only learn Python, you can run a full functioning psychology or neuroscience lab just using that software. Um, it's pretty easy to learn compared to a lot of other popular languages, especially things like C and Java. Um, and even R, R is sort of m more like Python than C or Java, um, but it's it's a bit more of a mess uh, to try and learn, quite frankly. Um, and maybe the best reason to learn Python if you're in this room is because that's what we're teaching. Um, so it's, it's kind of critical. Okay, uh, so moving on to sort of more detailed course stuff, and learning objectives. Um, there's a lot of learning objectives. Um, and there's another slide too. Um, this one is what I call the hard skills, uh, not hard, necessarily hard as in difficult, but um, contrasted with soft skills. So the more technical things. So by the end of this course, you will hopefully be able to extract meaning from data and also articulate limitations of the conclusions you can draw from the data. 
uh, write functional and efficient code in Python to perform basic data science tasks, use online tools for collaborative software development and project management, read and write data files in common formats like CSV and Excel, organize and manipulate uh, data structures, uh, work with uh, continuous, discrete, and factorial data. Um, as we go through, we'll sort of explain what those are um, if you don't remember from stats. Visualize data in a variety of, of graphical formats, perform exploratory data analysis using graphical and basic statistical operations, perform basic statistical processing on data like uh, filtering in temporal and spatial dimensions. So this is working with like EEG and, and fMRI data. Uh, build and run data processing pipelines on various uh, types of neuroscientific data, which basically means sort of like a whole series of steps of things that you would apply to particular uh, data. Um, understand basic concepts and common tools used in machine learning, um, probably actually not including deep neural networks, we might talk about them, and extend your skills using online resources. Um, so it's a lot, but it's all sort of closely interrelated. Um, and then I, I uh, like to emphasize that you're actually developing soft skills and, you know, sort of more sort of people skills, functional skills that might serve you in the workplace or in post, you know, postgraduate education, whatever. Um, so professional work ethic, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. Uh, be effective and productive in a hybrid in-person slash remote working environment. Um, so this class, we have these weekly labs, but there's a lot that's also remote and there's some uh, teamwork pieces that you can optionally do either in person or, or remotely. Uh, work collaboratively, effectively and productively in a distributed team. Mm -hmm. Manage projects, including time and human resources. Um, again, that's really sort of bundled into the teamwork. Peer review the work of other team members, teach other skills and solutions you discover and communicate your approach to discovering these. Articulate strengths and weaknesses as a data scientist working in a team and ways to improve your abilities. Uh, demonstrate skills you've developed using a portfolio of work um, that you can then show to potential supervisors or employees, uh, employers, sorry, uh, and use, communicate, uh, use and communicate the value of open reproducible code and data. Um, well, that last one, hopefully you've, you've sort of already learned. Um, so you're, you're part way there. Okay. Uh, course format, um, so there's a freely available online textbook on the web. Uh, that's the only book that's involved. Um, asynchronous online lessons, um, so the majority of these are uh, sort of lessons where I walk through uh, some code and sort of type it and explain what's going on uh, as we go. And it's set up in a way that you're encouraged to code along with me um, on your own time. Uh, there's a, a cloud-based co coding platform, so you won't need to install any software on your, com on your own computer. Um, you can install Python if you want, optionally, um, but we're providing you with access to this online platform called CoCalc, um, which is kind of nice because it's in the cloud, all your files are there, they're backed up, they're you know, safe, uh, all that kind of stuff. Um, optional uh, check-ins through Microsoft Teams on Mondays and Fridays. Talk a bit more about those uh, later. Um, the, these weekly labs uh, sessions on Wednesdays, and then online tutorials and practice through another uh, online platform called DataCamp. So DataCamp is like a massive online platform, kind of like Udacity or, or that sort of thing, but specifically for data science and learning to code. And we're, we're able to get free access uh, through um, having a, an academic affiliation. Um, and so that's uh, before we were using DataCamp as kind of the primary source for a lot of the lessons. Um, but it, it, you know, sort of mostly hitting the mark, but sometimes not. Um, so we've replaced that with those uh, Codalon online lessons uh, that I mentioned before. And what we're using DataCamp for is uh, essentially extra practice. Um, so it's going to reinforce a lot of the stuff that you've learned in the Codalons. And with coding, the thing is, you know, it's not like you, you sort of read about coding and you know how to do it. You actually have to do it. And it's, it's really a lab skill. You have to do it repeatedly. And so you work through the lesson, that's great. But then if you go on data camp and work through the sort of associated lesson, it's going to reinforce it and sort of present stuff in a different way. So um, it's sort of a, an add on that way. Um, now I'm going to talk a bit about my teaching approach which is maybe in some ways different from what you've experienced in the past. Um, so 
first of all, we expect you to develop coding and data science skills and also professional skills. Um, and I like these uh, sort of contrasts. Uh, I, as a professor, Danny is a TA. We're not the sage on the stage. Uh, I kind of am right now on my, my mini plastic stage. Um, but we're throughout this course, primarily we're, we're a guide on the side, meaning you're the primary learner, you're engaging in activities to learn, and we're here to sort of help you along the way and guide you when you get stuck or, or lost or that sort of thing and point you in the right direction. Um, so you are expected to take responsibility for your learning and put in the hours of trial and error to, to solve problems. And there's two sort of theoretical frameworks in education um, that we're working from. One is constructivism, um, which emphasizes the role that social interactions play in learning. Um, so this quote, what well, knowledge is created among learners working together, drawing on their individual perspectives and past experiential learning. Even as an individual, as you're learning, you know, it's not just sort of information hitting your brain and getting stuck there. You're actively processing that information. Maybe you're thinking about it. You're relating it to other information. Um, certainly, in coding, you're you know you're learning a lot through doing, but through the teamwork, especially. Um, and we found this even you know just sort of as people are working on individual assignments, um, we're quite happy if you guys are chatting amongst yourselves online, in person, whatever, supporting each other, helping each other out. Um, I think all of you sort of you know you're responsible for your own learning. You want to do well it's great you can help other people um i don't expect that anybody is going to just like you know do all the work and have somebody else you know just copy their work and you know get the same grade for no effort um and that's not what this is about this is about like supporting each other and helping each other constructively right um but we're we're very happy for you to be doing that and providing that kind of peer support and it turns out you learn a lot yourself when you're when you're doing that and explaining things um and then this uh, connectivism is the other uh, sort of theory or framework. Um, and I, when I came across this, I thought it was so cool um, because it says in the 21st century, so much knowledge is externalized from human minds in the form of the Internet. Um, you know, so much we don't really need to memorize anymore because we can just Google it or ask Siri or Alexa or, or whatever. Um, and even when it comes to coding, you know, most people who code don't know coding so well that they just sit there and code all day. They're constantly on the web looking up stuff. There's these online forums like uh, one called Stack Exchange. It's quite popular. Um, and you know, all day you're just sort of Googling like, how do I do this kind of thing? And looking at the answers and sort of thinking about that and how do I apply that to my problem uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so you know, that's really the case in, in coding, uh, maybe even more than other fields. Um, so there's less emphasis and need for us as individuals to remember specific facts or procedures because we can access that information quite easily when we need it. Um, but learning is more about how to use those resources and how to teach yourself and be sort of a, a lifelong self-directed learner um, and also to connect the information between them because it's extremely rare that when you Google the problem that you're having, you'll get an exact answer. Um, you'll get something that's probably like in the ballpark but you still have to think about how do you actually adapt that to your specific case or your specific problem. Um, and inevitably, you know, it's the internet. There will be lots of opinions and lots of ways to do that thing, and you need to sort of pick between them and, and figure out um, what seems most appropriate. Um, so, you know, again, just to sort of emphasize, this is a lab course. It's all about procedures and processes. Coding is all about that. Um, so you do need to sort of come with that mindset of being very sort of actively engaged in learning and problem solving and not expect that all the answers are, are necessarily sort of right there in front of you in you know, the textbook or whatever. You know, we try and structure things in such a way that the assessments that we do really are building on the stuff you've already learned. So it's not like, you know, um, OK, you know, here's assignment one, it's due Friday, um, you know, write 100 lines of code. You know, we're going to give you a lot of structure to get there. Uh, so that was the teaching approach, the learning approach. We treat you as an adult learner who brings mature and serious commitment to participating fully in the course. We assume that your motivation for taking the course is to learn how to use Python and perform data science, and it's not just sort of another credit for you. Um, so, you know, if it is another credit, you're going to have to sort of embrace um, learning to use Python regardless. Uh, the course also aims to give you experiences that are similar to what you might experience in a real workplace, uh, especially outside academia. 
Um, so these sort of soft skills or 21st century skills. So that's why they, there's teamwork and you know, self-directed learning and the portfolios and stuff built into the course. Um, and, and these are you know, genuine things that you know, when you look at surveys of employers in Canada and you know, what predicts good salaries, those are the kind of skills you need uh, on top of just the basic technical skills. Um, you'll need to spend time learning and working on your own. But as I say, communication with your peers will help you immensely. And uh, this is definitely not a class where you can sort of put it off and then binge work and cram uh, at the end. Um, it builds steadily throughout the term and you really need to keep up with it. Um, you know, there's, there's some flexibility built in, um, but definitely you need to plan on you know, putting in the hours on, on a weekly basis. Um, and I, I copied with permission this quote from a student who took the course in its first iteration. Um, so she said, I do find there's a learning curve when it comes to starting to learn coding, something I'm not super familiar with and making sure that I'm taking my time to really grasp the information I'm taking in has posed a challenge. Um, and that's because it's again, it's not just that you sort of read it once and memorize it. There's much more to it. I'm used to reading information from a textbook and just memorizing the facts, definitions and data for tests. It's different to actually apply the information that I'm learning. It's a different learning style, but I currently enjoy learning. Um, I think it's something many students may find they need to adjust to. So I, I thought that was nice because that's you know, somebody else's perspective, sort of um, giving you a sense of, of what to expect and where the challenges might be, but also the rewards. Uh, so in terms of getting help, um, you know, as I say, one of the course learning objectives is to extend your skills learning online resources, using online resources, um, and data scientists do this all the time. So that's definitely not cheating, and that's not us like being lazy and not teaching you everything. It's we're actually teaching you something. It's just something a little different. Um, the peer to peer help peer helping um, is uh, really valuable, and it's built into the class through things like tools, demos, and, and, and team projects. Talk more about that uh, very soon. Um, these lab sessions, so uh, some of the lab sessions will be sort of more tutorial where we're walking through code. Other ones, especially later in the term and when there are big assignments uh, coming up, we'll have just kind of open lab sessions where we're here to you know, sort of answer questions and help you if you're getting stuck and that sort of thing. Uh, the check-ins, um, I might elaborate on those. If, yeah, if I have a slide more detailed on the check-ins. Um, so basically Monday and Friday, we'll do these check-ins on Teams. So just 30 minutes long at 2.30. So the same time that this class starts on Wednesdays, which hopefully will be relatively conflict free for most people's schedules. Um, they're optional. Everything, I mean, everything's optional. You don't do anything. You just don't get a good grade. Um, but the, you know, all the check-ins, we're not taking attendance. It's really, we're there for you. And if you get something out of it, great. If you don't, don't feel pressure to attend. Um, but those are mostly going to be just kind of open office hours where you can show up, ask questions, um, you know, give advice, give feedback if, if there's stuff you're struggling with. Um, Danny and I will both be there. Um, uh, if ahead of time you send us questions, we might actually prep a little bit especially if we're seeing sort of the same question coming up from a number of people. Um, we might actually prep something to sort of walk through and explain that uh, with some code examples and that kind of thing. Um, but they're, yeah, they're basically there for, for your support. Uh, and uh, our main source or platform for communication for the course will be Teams. Uh, so please don't email us um, for the most part. Um, there may be cases where you, you want to email, but if you're looking for help or anything about the course, our strong preference is that you message us on Teams. Um, you know, if, if it's sort of a question you think other people in the class might be experiencing, you can post it in the sort of class chat on Teams. Um, but you can also just direct message me and or Danny um, with particular questions that you have. Um, and, you know, I, I sort of mentioned work-life balance before. We both work a lot. We work odd hours. Uh, I think we're both kind of night owls. Yeah. Um, so, you know, sometimes you might message us at like 1030 at night and get an immediate response. Um, but don't sort of think that's the expectation or the norm. <laughs> right. Um, try and expect, you know, a 24 hour turnaround time uh, for responses and we'll try and be better, um, but maybe we'll slow around the weekends uh, as well. Um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're definitely trying to support you as much as we can without like losing our minds. 
Uh, okay, that table's a little small, um, but uh, this is where I walk through exactly how you are graded. Um, so the, I break the assessment and evaluation into formative assessments and summative evaluations. Um, so formative is used in the sense of forming you or shaping you. So the formative assessments are all things that are graded a, on a pass-fail basis. So basically, as long as you submit something that looks like what we asked you to do, um, you get the full points for that. And so the point of those is more to support your learning in different kinds of ways. And I'll, I'll sort of explain what those are in a minute. The summative evaluations are to sum up your learning, and those are the pieces that are graded, so like assignments and, and things like that. Most of your grade comes from those summative evaluations, um, since the formative assessments are, are pretty easy points to get. Um, but that, you know, 10%, that's like a full letter grade right there um, that you can get pretty easily with, you know, pass fail. Um, the other thing I'll point out, and remember how to use clicker after a year. Yeah, um, so at the top, I call it's still called XP there. Um, I used to call them experience points now, I just call them course points, but whatever. Um, total number of points available in the class is 10,000. Um, and then your grade is basically, you know, we basically just cut two zeros down. And, you know, so if you get 9,000 points, then your grade is 90% and you get an A+. Plus. Um, so there's basically 10,000 points on offer, but there's a whole another 10%, 1,000 points that are available as bonus points. Um, and I want to emphasize these are intended as bonus points because last year people, you know, you get into this mindset of like all the points and I need all the points and I, you know, this kind of thing. Um, the whole point of having those bonus points is to try and build in some sort of flexibility and accommodations to the way that your, your grade is computed. So you don't necessarily always have to, like if there's an emergency or you're going to be, you know, late submitting something or like you just can't submit something, um, sort of built in that that's not going to penalize you that much. Uh, so, so the bonus points are definitely like optional. You can get a great grade in the course without doing any of the bonus things, but some of them you'll, you'll probably end up getting pretty easily anyway. Um, so I'll, I'll go through sort of the, the core points first and then talk about the bonus. Well, maybe I'll just go down the list and talk about them as they come. Okay, so assignment one uh, is coming up. It's due on Friday. It's pretty easy and basically, if you haven't looked at it already, it's just uh, getting you set up on all those different uh, online platforms that I talked about. And, um, you know, it's just you, you do enough little things on them to show that you got on and uh, that's it. So not worth a lot of points, shouldn't take you a lot of time, especially if you're here now, because we're going to walk through a lot of the, the core pieces of that today. Uh, assignments two to five um, are sprinkled throughout the, the term uh, pretty much like every two weeks you'll have an assignment or a project due. The assignments are smaller, the projects are bigger, the assignments are individual, the projects are team uh, designed to be done as a team. Team size like three to five people would be optimal. Um, all of those are basically giving you data and some coding problems and you have to write code to do the things we tell you to do. Uh, and, you know, sort of inevitably they get a little more complex as, as time goes on. So you're sort of building mastery and uh, applying it as you go through the course. Um, you can see there assignments two to five worst mark is worth uh, 250 bonus XP. So what that means is that you can skip submitting one assignment altogether without penalty. That's not going to count against your sort of accumulation of 10,000. Or you can submit all the assignments and whichever one you do the worst on, You'll still get you'll get some bonus points for it, but it'll you know sort of crap out on one and still get a, a decent mark. Um, projects uh, don't have that flexibility because with the team, hopefully you're sort of more together and supporting each other. Um, I'll talk a bit more about sort of issues around team dynamics uh, in a minute. So the projects are are worth um, um, and just you know so point out assignments two to five. Your three best are worth a thousand, so that totals up to three thousand. They're not worth three thousand each, and then the projects are worth uh, somewhat more than the individual assignments. Um, and then we ask you to do what we call demos, and uh, you are expected to do at least two of those. You can do a third one if you want. Um, slash your first one often, and this I'll explain a bit more about them, but often. 
it's pretty free form and people sort of stress at first. Um, so maybe your first one is like a practice one and you don't get a super great grade. So you can sort of, again, sort of call that your worst mark, submit two more for better marks. Um, but basically the demos are kind of as they sound. It's uh, an opportunity for you to uh, engage in some of that peer to peer teaching by doing something that is oriented towards the other people in the class that teaches them something uh, re related to the course. And so, you know, this covers a pretty broad spectrum. Um, you can submit your demos as a video, you can submit it as a written document, you can submit it as code, you can submit it as a website, you know, pretty much anything goes. Um, I've yet to see an interpretive dance, but. Last year, Nathan was going to do a puppet show. Ah, uh, yes, you remember that now. Yeah. <laughs> puppet shows, uh, totally acceptable. Um, you know, it just has to be relevant, of course, in some way. So, so figure that out. Um, so, a variety of formats. Um, you know, one of the first demos in the first time we taught it was here's how to make a demo video and upload it to Microsoft Stream. Um, so, that was pretty clever. Um, you know, so it can be, you know, here's how I figured out a cool thing in the course, or here's like a hack or a, a shortcut for, you know, something that we're doing in the course. Um, other things are like people have, you know, just sort of Googled uh, YouTube videos on data science and found one that was pretty clearly interesting and basically written a little mini review uh, of it as to, you know, why it was interesting, how it sort of enlightened you or inspired you or, or something like that. Um, you know, lots of different options. Some people have uh, found, uh, you know, open data sets online and applied some of what we taught in the class to a new data set. And, and that's totally cool because that's, you know, even if you're essentially doing the same thing you already learned, you're showing that you know how to do it and apply it to new data. And often, you know, there's little tweaks to that. Um, and there's some flexibility there, right, because it should be related to the course. So it could be that you're applying coding techniques you've learned in the course to say there's like an open database of uh, movie revenues, you know, so opening day box office revenues for a whole bunch of different movies. So that's not neural data science, but you're applying the coding techniques you used to that data set. So that sort of thing is acceptable. There's lots of open neuroscience data sets as well. So lots there. As we get closer to that, we'll talk more about you know, what those demos look like, and we'll give you some examples from the past. Um, the only thing to be mindful of is what doesn't work well is finding some sort of coding demo that's out there on the web and just sort of submitting that. Um, you know, at, at the extreme, that's plagiarism. Obviously, if you're just taking somebody else's work, um, some of what we've seen though is like uh, on data camp, there's lots of exercises that you can do in lessons and people will just sort of, you know, do a lesson and, and use that as their demo. That's I mean, because you're just following on a, along a lesson that doesn't demonstrate a lot of, you know, sort of capacity besides a willingness to learn. Um, so you might get a few points, but, but not a lot of points. Um, unless you, you know, find something that's a little more sort of peripheral to the course, but talk about why you thought learning this particular skill was interesting or, or something like that. Um, so, you know, in part it's what you do and in part it's the, the spin you, you put on it and how you present it. Uh, so that's demos. Uh, portfolio. So the final submission for the portfolio will be right at the end of term. And it's literally meant to be sort of a portfolio of work that you've done in this class that it can include the demos. Uh, in fact, that's you know sort of an easy, there, there's going to be, I think at the end, we're, we're looking for six items to be in your portfolio. So if you've done two or three demos, that's an easy sort of checkbox. Um, and then we're looking for you to sort of cover in your portfolio, showing examples of coding that you've done in the course uh, as well that are sort of sampled from, from different phases of the course. So, so not all just from one particular lesson or something like that. Um, Ideally, those are done as a website. Um, we're going to sort of do some lessons on how to easily create a simple portfolio on the web and populate it uh, with code. Um, so like I say, the final submission is at the end of the term, but there is a draft submission that you can do earlier on in the term worth uh, bonus points, so 100 bonus points, so not a lot if you don't do it. Um, but the, the kicker is that we will give you feedback on that draft and your final mark will probably be a lot better if you submit that draft, get the feedback and integrate the feedback than if what we're seeing at the end and grading is your sort of first attempt at it. Um, and the other thing is we will, you know, for, for the draft submissions, 
we encourage people to share those so that you can sort of see what other people are doing and get inspired or you know, sort of share ideas and that kind of thing. Um, so that covers the summative evaluation piece. Um, so although it seems like a lot, really it's like, you know, every two weeks you're going to have a project or an assignment due, and that's going to be sort of the culmination of the material we've covered in the course in that period, um, with, you know, sort of building, of course. Uh, and then uh, the demos, you know, only three, two to three throughout the term, and then the portfolio that's really sort of, you're just packaging work that you've already done. Not to say there's not work in doing that packaging, but there's not, you know, it's just sort of an extra layer. Um, in terms of the formative assessments, which uh, again are graded pass fail, um, you get credit for doing the data camp lessons. So we're, we're able to see which lessons you've completed. Data camp awards you XP, so experience points for each lesson you do. And, and literally, like, you know, each lesson, like each video you watch, you get a few XP. Each little individual page of coding practice that you do, you get some XP, so it accumulates. Um, and there's, I forget the formula, it's in the syllabus. Um, but basically, we've laid out a set of data camp lessons for you. And if you complete all of those, the XP sort of pump through the formula, result in 500 points. So if you only get through some of the data camp stuff, you'll get partial points sort of based on the XP that you earn. Um, you can hack that a bit as well because all we're going to look at is your data camp XP. Um, we're not necessarily going to look at like which lessons you've completed. We will because we're curious, um, but data camp has all kinds of other lessons. So if you feel like, okay, like, you know, like this thing that we covered in class, there's a data camp lesson, but I feel like I've nailed that. I don't necessarily want to do more of that, but there's this other cool thing that I've always wanted to learn. Go do that data camp lesson you'll get the XP that'll count uh, towards it. So there's some flexibility around, you know, sort of how you earn those data camp points. Um, peer assessments are basically the projects are done in teams. Um, actually, what I should say is the projects are designed to be done in teams. Um, if for whatever reason you elect not to build a team and just do the whole project yourself, um, that's probably a regrettable decision in many cases. Uh, they're, they're big enough that it's a lot more work if you're trying to do it all on your own. Um, we're encouraging you and you actually get bonus points. See down at the bottom, if your project team size is three or more people, um, that should say greater than or equal to three people, um, then uh, you get a few bonus points uh, for that. Um, so assuming you did um, work in a team, um, we expect peer assessments, uh, which are basically just sort of rating the contributions of different team members. Um, and in general, I've, there's a fairly detailed discussion of this in the syllabus when you look on the web. Um, we haven't had a lot of problems with team dynamics. Uh, mostly, you know, people are engaged, people are supporting each other, and things work out well. And um, we also have these meet and greets, so there's opportunities to get to know people before you form a team that you know might help you make some some good life choices there. Um, if you have a problem with a team member, again, learning outcome is learning to work professionally in uh, you know, a, a team environment. So step one is to try and work those problems out internally. Um, like if somebody is not responding or not, you know, not pulling their weight, not doing what they said they'd do, we expect you to reach out to them first and just sort of, you know, constructively say like, is there a problem, you know, are you going to be able to get this done? Is there something going on? You know, because often, you know, crap happens and maybe people are too in it or too stressed or whatever to necessarily reach out and tell the team. But maybe if you just reach out, you can sort of figure that out. Um, if somebody's really not contributing, if they can't contribute, you can come to us. We can, you know, try and sort it out. Um, so, you know, hopefully for the most part, the peer assessments are pretty much like everybody contributed about equally. Sometimes somebody really shines and somebody really like, you know, has extra time, really sort of takes the lead on something. And the other, you know, I've seen other team members say like, yeah, this person like, you know, I felt like I did my, my solid bit, but they definitely did like, you know, 20% more. Um, so you can reward people if they do go above and beyond. Um, and hopefully it's more of that than like punishing people um, for not doing anything. But in the worst case scenario, if somebody doesn't contribute, doesn't respond to you, doesn't respond to us, if we're trying to sort things out, doesn't contribute, um, if you give them a poor, like if everybody on the team says, yeah, that person like did absolutely nothing, that will impact their mark um, and they won't get the points for the project. Um, whereas otherwise everybody sort of gets the same points for the project. 
Um, so if you have questions about that down the line, uh, certainly ask me. Um, it's really like it's it's meant basically to prevent freeloading without even punishing people who are just having a tough time. Um, self assessments. Uh, so these are every two weeks um, through Teams. You'll have the link to the Microsoft form, and they're pretty short. It's just two questions. Um, one is like what's going well, or what's like a, a cool thing that you've learned in the class um, over the last couple of weeks, and the other question is like. Are you experiencing any challenges or something you don't understand or something like that? Um, and this is, you know, from your perspective, um, it may feel like make work, but it, you know, scientifically, it's been shown that doing this kind of self-reflection is constructive to your own learning and can give you insights. Um, and it's super, super helpful for me because I read all of them. I try and respond a lot of the time if there's anything respond to a ball. Um, but it's nice to know, you know, what's going well or what people like, uh, and, and equally like what's not going well and often it's through looking through these uh, self-assessments and seeing like six people reporting the same challenge that i realized oh this is you know something we need to address in a check-in or something we need to you know, change in the course or, or something like that so they're they're really useful um and yeah self-assessments skip one or bonus points oh right so there's actually seven self-assessments uh, throughout the term so if you do all seven, you get uh, bonus points for doing the extra one. But if you like forget or just you know, can't get it together to submit one one week one time, uh, then that's bonus points. So you don't lose any of your four points. Uh, meet and greets. So we we did this last year. It made maybe sort of intuitively more sense in the online environment. Basically, a meet and greet is you connect with somebody else in the class. Um, and you know, this year it can be in person if, if you like, but it can also just be through Teams, text chat, whatever. Just like a five to 15 minute conversation. Um, in the fully online version of the class, we designed it so that people could actually meet each other since nobody ever saw each other except through Teams. Um, but it, uh, I find it works really well because you know there's team-based projects and you know emphasizing this peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, that's a lot easier if you actually sort of know some people first and, and get to know them. Um, so you can do uh, up to five meet and greets for bonus points, and there's just like there will be a form uh, that you can use to report that this happened and this is the person I talked to. Um, optional if if you really don't want to engage, um, that's fine. But uh, I encourage you, you know, I've, I've seen feedback from that, like made a new friend for life. So, you know, there can be some really positive outcomes. Um, and then other bonus points, if you don't ask for an extension all term, we'll give you 200 bonus points. Um, and again, those are bonus points, so it's not meant to punish people who need extensions. But um, if you get through the whole term without needing one, then, you know, there's a nice little bonus for that. And for the having the project teams uh, of three people or more. OK, so I'm going to pause there. I have a couple more slides, but just to check in if there's any questions about that or anything I've said so far. Yeah. So for the Vita cap, yep. I haven't even seen the uh, no, I don't think we set that up yet, actually. Yes, it's right. I, I look at Danny as if it was his job, but I didn't tell you it was your job. So. But I'll take it. <laughs> no, no, we haven't. All right. Um, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Did you all get co-calc yeah. invitations? Okay, good. Other questions? And, and again, like it's a lot of information, so if you have questions later, shoot me a message on Teams. OK, so just sort of the high level schedule for the term. Uh, September is focused on just learning Python and learning it in the context of, of data science. Uh, moving late into September into early October, we're going to start applying Python first to behavioral data um, because behavioral data is sort of simpler to approach than, than other kinds of neuroscience data. Ultimately, it's you know, it can be considered neuroscience data because it's the brain that's creating the behavior, right? And importantly, in most good neuroscience work, you want to know what behavior somebody was actually doing when their brain was doing whatever you're measuring. Um, so it is a, a good foundation there. Uh, October, we'll go into exploratory data analysis, uh, which is basically visualization and basic statistics. 
I'm not going to teach you any statistics that you didn't already hopefully learn in 2501. Um, it's just like t-tests and, and simple things like that. And I'm not going to expect you to compute degrees of freedom or standard errors or, or anything by hand. Um, it's basically just showing you how to use Python to do a t-test and, and tell if something's different or not. Uh, October, then we move into single unit data, so data from electrodes stuck into actual brains, um, not our own. Uh, in October and November, we'll be working with EEG and event-related potential data, which is sort of just a way of processing EEG data, so electrodes on the scalp for recording electrical activity. Uh, November, we'll do some structural and functional MRI work, and then right at the end of the term, dabble in machine learning. Um, so that's sort of the high level sort of perspective on where we're going. Uh, and just a few things to keep in mind, um, and this is, you know, in a sense, this is like the angry comments that we got last year. We're trying to forestall by, by uh, explaining our rationale here. Um, so firstly, this is not an intro to computer science course. Um, you're learning to code, and many intro to computer science courses also teach you to code. That's probably the extent of the similarity. And if you've taken, how many people have taken an intro CS course out of curiosity? A few, right. Um, so if you've taken this, some of our approach may seem different. Um, and in some cases, I think intro to CS courses take more time to cover topics that we're going to go through what may feel like more quickly. Um, but at the same time, keep in mind an intro to CS course is a 1,000 level course, and this is a 3,000 level course. So our expectations are a little different. Um, and we're not trying to teach you to be a computer scientist. We're trying to teach you to be a data scientist, and you need to use code to do that as a tool. Um, so it's not necessarily going to be sort of as full-featured or robust an education in coding, but you're going to learn the things you need to know to work with data and do the things that we expect you to do. Um, yeah, uh, so, so a few sort of differences there. Um, it's not like uh, probably any other neuroscience or psychology course. Um, I mean, it is a lab course, so it's more like lab courses in the sense that you're doing things, even if you're not like pipetting or using microscopes, you know, you're using a computer keyboard. Um, it's still you're learning techniques and you're doing much more than, than memorizing. Uh, and it's a skill that you, you have to practice um, to, to do well. And you will spend lots of time going in circles and getting frustrated, and this is totally normal. Um, so, you know, some people enjoy that process. Uh, I think it's, it's you know, not always enjoyable for any of us, um, but just appreciate it is a process and don't expect that everything's going to work right the first time. Uh, and then style matters, and I touched on this earlier, but um, we, you know, in the assignments and the projects, there is a proportion of the grade that's assigned for coding style. And that's just like when I teach a course that involves a written submission, I have 10% of the grade that's for writing style. Same sort of thing. So it's not enough just to write code. You really need to write code that's clear and readable by other people. Um, and and we'll, we'll cover you know, what means, what is clean code, what is good coding style. Um, but we are going to be sort of looking for that and grading it and uh, rewarding for that. And that actually sort of loops back uh, to being not an intro to computer science course. I am told that in computer science courses, they don't necessarily grade you on coding style. Um, told that by other students who weren't happy with our grading them on coding style. So, you know, uh, that may or may not be everybody's experience. But um, regardless, you know, uh, we expect you to develop good habits from the start. It's a lot easier to learn good habits than it is to undo bad habits later. And this may be your only opportunity to learn those good habits. So, you know, we're going to do that. And like I said before, programming style is like APA style. Um, right? It's just a way that we operate. It's a way that we expect things to be done. And beyond just being formality, it does actually make things easier to use, easier to understand. Um, one thing that you learn, you learn throughout this course, is it's very easy to sort of hammer through and get some code that works and generates the correct output. Uh, and then you come back to it a couple of weeks later and you look at it and you, like, even though you wrote it, you have no idea what it's doing or, or how you got it to work. Um, so good coding style can really help with that, you know, sort of future you problem as well as other people looking at your code. And I, I just repeated this quote from earlier uh, and put a big box around it just to emphasize it's not just me and Danny 
who want good code, improving code readability benefits individual researchers and the wider neuroscience community. Okay, so um, I think we're kind of at the end of the slides. Uh, we're going to cover these various aspects of the tech stack. So again, just the technologies that we use in the course. Um, the course website, um, hopefully you've been there already. Uh, I don't think there's much to say about that. That's where the syllabus lives. That's where the schedule lives. Um, the only thing to say about the schedule is uh, I will be updating it uh, as necessary, especially like uh, more and more things will become hyperlinks to the actual lessons uh, that are involved um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and for due dates, the due dates are listed uh, on the schedule, but Teams will be sort of the final official resource for due dates. So I won't make any due date earlier than it says in the schedule, but if any extensions occur, um, that'll be on Teams. The schedule might not reflect those. Textbook also online linked from the, the course website. It's linked from the top of the MS Teams page, um, which is Google. Um, so that's uh, pretty, pretty easy to find. Um, I sent up that earlier email with kind of the pre-reading chapters that you were sort of expected to do and you know, optional. Um, beyond those introductory ones, basically everything is sort of expected. But uh, pretty much what you'll find is that the lessons that I'm going to be releasing as videos are me walking through the textbook chapters because after the first, you know, the first ones are much more wordy. Um, but once we get into coding and data science, most of the chapters are just like code with explanation. Um, so, you know, you don't necessarily have to look at the, the textbook if you do the videos and the code alongs, but it's just sort of there uh, as a resource. Um, Teams, uh, I already mentioned, that's our communications platform. That's where we'll do our check ins. Um, and then CoCalc and DataCamp, I think Danny is going to cover. Yes? Yeah. And uh, DataCamp invites are now out. Oh, awesome. Thank you. For that. Thank you. Oh, I did have more slides. Um, oh, look, it's the website. I've oh, we seen it. Look, it's the textbook. Um, look, it's Microsoft Teams. Um, but just to, Teams has changed a little bit, but if you go to the general tab or the general channel, that's where you'll see across the top links to the syllabus, schedule, textbook, co-calc, and data camp, if you want those links. Uh, and this is what data camp looks like. Um, this is basically if you log on and you see assignments, you'll see a list of your assignments and the due dates. Oh, the other thing I should say is the due dates um, are not something that we're enforcing for, and actually that's something I should have said earlier in terms of grading. Um, generally speaking, for the graded stuff, like the assignments and the projects, the weight penalty is 2% per hour. Um, so that means that if you're a little bit late, you lose a very little bit of your points. Um, but obviously, you know, the later you are, the more your grade drops pretty appreciably. Um, so I, I did that rather than just saying like 10% per day, 10% per day, and then getting into arguments about whether, like, if it's due at 11.59 p.m., if it's submitted at 12.05, is that a day late or is that five minutes late? And if it's only five minutes late and we have a five minute grace period, do we have a 10 minute grace period? <laughs> we have a 45 minute grace period. Um, so it's just, you know, it just scales by the minutes. That's only for the graded assignments. So th for things like data camp due dates, those are suggestions. That's basically like if you're sort of keeping up with the course material and get the data camp lesson done by that date, then you'll be sort of you know, keeping pace with, with what we're covering in the class. Um, if you fall behind, there's really no penalty. Um, we're going to check uh, the XP at the very end of the term, basically when we're computing the grades, so sometime in the exam period. So, you know, it certainly happened in the past that people missed some lessons and then just went and, and did them at the end. Or, like I say, at that point, maybe doing that lesson seems completely pointless because you already know the stuff. But there's some other cool lesson on data camp. You can do that and get points that way. So again, those due dates are just suggestions. Um, and then Danny will show you CoCalc in more detail. It's just a screenshot there. Okay, so that's what I got.